This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Mercier's. And joining us this week is New York-based composer Jim Holt. Jim is, in addition to being a fantastic composer, also a, a podcaster, one of the maybe two other new music podcasts that I've that i'm aware of on the web uh my ears are open you should check it out my ears are open.net jim thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for having me guys it's really really great to be here it's a lot it's it's we're one of the one of the first things we did when we thought we should we should do a podcast about this <laughs> stuff was look around for other people that were doing it uh and and you were i think the only one that i that i could find <laughs> at the time I, I think i've since found one other but, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was actually kind of the situation I find myself in when I started the show three years ago. Um, and I was trying to decide if I was even going to do it or not, just seeing, you know, who else was doing something like this and what did I like and not like about what other other people were doing with uh, contemporary music and composers and musicians. And so, yeah, that's well, uh, we're glad like that. that you we're glad that you put it together. Before we talk about that, I wanted to actually talk to you about your music. Um sure. Can you uh, tell us maybe just a little bit about what what you're up to right now in New York, just in general? Well, actually, honestly, this is this has been kind of a, a strange year for me in terms of uh, composition. I mean, like actual writing, the writing piece mm -hmm. of composition. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been lucky over the last uh, you know six months or so to have some some nice performances here in New York, and actually some others around the country, and um, a few things coming up. Um, but the honest truth between you and me and whoever I guess is watching this <laughs> is that uh, it'll be our little uh, secret. <laughs> it'll be our little secret you uh, across the nation. Um, I I actually haven't. It's been almost a year since I've written a note. Oh and wow! There's there's been uh, a lot of a lot of reasons for that, um, which we you know we can talk about if you want. But uh, but I've, I've definitely been in a little bit of a, a you know contemplation period. Let's say. Yeah, I think I think we've all been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in in I think we've all been to, in in periods where even when we try to write things, it's not it's not worth sticking around with. Yeah, and yeah. It, sometimes I feel like I've struggled through some things that would have been much less stressful and taken about as much time as if I had just not done it for a while and waited. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I mean, some of it, I think some of it's a little bit self-imposed and I mean, um, some of it's not, I mean, you know, honestly, if, if there were people pounding down my door asking for pieces, I, I might be writing more than I am right now. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, since there hasn't been, it's been a nice chance to kind of gather my thoughts around, you know, what do I really want to be doing? What I really want to be writing? How do I want to, you know, can I, how much control can I have over any commission situations and just all all these things and it's been actually really nice to not come home from work every day and have to worry about i need to be writing something and just kind of clear my head a little bit around all of this and uh yeah ho hopefully they'll get started again soon but that's it's it's actually been kind of a good a good thing i think looking back yeah those sound like incredibly valuable questions to spend sp some good time on yeah and, yeah yeah and, and i think one of the things that this uh is brings up is the the things that uh composers do that are not writing music mm -hmm. um so you're yeah. you're managing to to be involved in a lot of different uh organizations and a lot of different projects without putting pen to paper and you want to tell us about what what you're up to at, at the yeah, moment yeah i mean it, it's uh I, I always find myself i have a hard time saying no sometimes when uh exciting <laughs> projects come up we can relate i to feel that. like that's the composer way you know? <laughs> yeah so I, so i think that yeah. you know the other side of not having been writing much the last um year or so is that uh i've still been able to keep myself in the midst of all this contemporary music stuff um so i mean i've been working on the podcast still my podcast my ears are open Great. and um one of the other things that, that comes up about once a year is um some good friends of mine started a music festival in san francisco called the uh, switchboard music festival um and this is one of those uh you know all day once a year uh marathon style uh festivals and it, it really focuses mostly on um music from the bay area and california but there are groups and composers and musicians from other places as well but um one of the things that i've um been happy to help them with um from here is to produce a podcast for them every year mm -hmm. 
so this is also the third year I've been working on that for them. So um, there, if you're, if anybody listening is in San Francisco, the next Switchboard Festival is on April 1st, and you can hear um, three or four. Um, there should be a fifth, maybe later today or tomorrow, um, episode with artists who are going to be on the festival. Um, so that's that's been one one cool little project. Um, um, there's a, a new group here in New York called uh, Hotel Elephant, which has their debut concert actually this <coughs> week. Um, and uh, ironically, they're, uh, they got the name of that group, Hotel Elephant, from... Um, actually, I don't think I can say friend of the show because I'm, <laughs> I'm not one of you guys. No, but, you can say it. Yeah. But uh, friend, friend of the show, uh, Alex Ross's book. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Uh, he, he was talking about Mahler, I think, and some of the, the composers around Austria... Um, and there was this, this place that they all went to or found themselves in. I don't, I don't know the details of the story, but it was this place called Hotel Elephant. And I, I think they heard about it in his book and it was a big inspiration for them starting this group. So anyway, kind of babbling on a bit, but, but I've been helping them, um, produce some videos, um, leading up to the concert. So they, cool. they made a little, like two or three minute videos for each piece that's going to be on the concert. And then, nice. um, David Little is going to be the, the guest composer and I'll, I'll speak to him kind of interview style uh either before or after intermission or something like that that's great so you so this the style of of these this things you're doing uh for for, uh the uh, switchboard music festival is is that similar to your podcast that you do uh, on a regular basis Uh, actually yeah it's totally different format actually okay cool so so the one if if you haven't listened to my ears are open um, the format is basically that you actually don't hear me at all. <laughs> um, I, I, I get to talk to these really amazing musicians, but then I ask them just four really basic, simple questions and then just try and get them to tell us their stories. Yeah. Um, and then I just edit myself out so we could just hear them tell their stories. And, um, you know, part of the idea is just that I wanted to give these people a platform and not ask them any leading questions and just give them a place where they could say whatever they wanted and... You know, I, I didn't want to be be part of that at all. I just wanted to give them a place to do that. Um, so, so that's the format of that show. But for the Switchboard podcast, we decided those are going to be five minutes, no matter what. They're just like five minutes long. It's going to be um, the artists talking about their music and coming to San Francisco for the festival, and then hearing their music. And that that's all it is. So it's just like these little, little, uh, um, just little short episodes, just so you can get a taste of what to expect that day. Well, that's that's great. So you you do these um, to go along with the festival itself, yeah. uh, and and is the the expectation is that people that are listening to this podcast or people that are going to the festival or people that um, kind of want to experience the festival without being able to go. Uh, well, I mean, ideally, it's both. I think, but mm-hmm. um, but really, the idea is as a kind of a, a marketing tool, you know, like, so in the, yeah, you know, in the four or five weeks leading up to the festival, we're releasing about two episodes every week cool. so that, um, when they send their email blast out, they can say, you know, check out these artists are going to be on the festival. Yeah. Um, so they can get an idea of what, what they can expect that day. Jim, I have a question about, um, your podcast because we've been through an experience over the past year of, trying to do a podcast about new music, whatever that means. So yep. whatever that means is one of the things we've had to figure out. Have you found that doing a podcast, your, your podcast, My Ears Are Open, has been extremely educational about new music well, for yourself? Um, well, for myself, yeah. Well, I mean, for myself, the biggest pleasure has actually just been talking to all these people. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, if, if you look through the list of, of guests I've been able to have on the show, I mean... You know, in reality, I'm actually really, really shy, and at concerts, I can never bring myself to talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. So this has been a great excuse to get to know some, some really great musicians. Um, but the educational piece of this is like one of the reasons I started in the first place is I had imagined that it would be a really great resource or archive for young composers, student composers, mm-hmm. and I'd always had in mind that in an ideal world that you know music departments and universities would you know, encourage their students to, to know about a resource like this. Because um, mm-hmm. I feel like when I was going to music school, when I was studying composition, I was, you know, I was 
looking back, really fortunate that when my professors told me, this is the way you should act in a rehearsal, this is how you should deal with your parts and your scores, and this is, you know, all, all this kind of professional stuff and working with musicians. Mm -hmm. It turns out they were all basically right, and they gave me good advice. Oh, good. But um, I always found that it meant so much more when the musicians said it themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm in a rehearsal and I, you know, a violinist that I really respected, you know, had a comment for me about the score or the parts, um, or a conductor had a suggestion about, you know, uh, rehearsal, my role in a rehearsal or something like that, it meant so much more, even if it was the same information than what my teachers were telling me. So I was hoping that if I could talk to all these musicians who play contemporary music all the time and we could hear from them that it's not just your teachers saying this, but th these are what actual professional contemporary music musicians appreciate and don't appreciate. These are the experiences that have been really great for them and the experiences that haven't been great for them. And so it's just all, here's a whole list of lessons we can learn from people who are doing this every day. It sounds cool. like an incredible archive yeah. yeah yeah so so there's 75 of these now so you've been doing this now for for three years is there anything um that in particular that that you have learned so you're interviewing mostly performers yeah is there anything that well, they're all performing yeah they're all musicians yeah so you, you is there anything that that sticks out to you that uh you've learned that maybe fr from the the uh what's the word i'm looking for the whole the massive quantity you've got a, a survey now of 75 people yeah. uh is there anything that sticks out to you o over all the years from, it from these well it turns out that musicians are really happy if you're not a jerk <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i, I mean it, one of the interesting things is that there has been like a lot of uh consensus around almost everybody i spoke to i mean on the one hand these this is not shocking information but on the other hand, like I said, it's good to hear it from the players themselves. Mm -hmm. So things like, you know, people appreciate proofread scores. You know, people appreciate page turns that work. Yeah. Um, people like that if the composer comes to a rehearsal that you're willing to, you know, have some level of collaboration or, you know, at least, you know, you know, don't don't jump down my throat for missing that sharp on the very first rehearsal, you know, yeah. like. Just, you know, things like that, you know, that are, you know, on the one hand, really common sense, but I think it's good to hear from them themselves that these are things that, these really are things that are important to them. Um, you know, the things that, that make a difference. And, you know, a, a good example is I spoke to all the players of Ethel. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they said some things that come up with a lot of the interviews, but they were so adamant about it. And that is, um, you know, the reality is, even for these groups that are so committed to performing contemporary music, that... Um, they often don't have the rehearsal time that you would hope they would have. You know, mm -hmm. those these guys are monsters and they can and tear through it because they play the contemporary music all the time. But they don't always have, you know, they might only have three or four or five hours in total for a rehearsal before a first performance. It's just reality in a lot of cases. Yeah. And so you don't want them to spend one, two, three of those hours just trying to figure out um, what you've written on the page, you know. You don't want them to have to wonder if um, that accidental is right. You don't have to wonder if, um, you know, if they should have a cue there or not. You don't have to worry about just all these all these things that the more the more of those things that composers um, that we can do to save them time is actually going to give them more rehearsal time. In the end. So so thinking of things like that really really make a difference. Yeah, and those are those are some of the things that like I've had composition teachers tell me before. But yeah, hear, hearing it come from a performer and having it like be in a rehearsal yeah. and having it not work and then and they <laughs> having... all say it yeah. they all say it <laughs> yeah that's incredible I'm... How, so how how do you listen to podcasts fast i want to listen to this archive now <laughs> <laughs> and actually i should say since you know there's 75 episodes yeah. there there are two there are two that i always like to recommend as personal personal favorites and they're actually from quite a while ago mm -hmm. um but if you have a chance to listen, if you had not listened to the show, I would really encourage you to listen to the episode with Evan Zaporin. He's a clarinetist in the Bang on the Can All-Stars and director of Gamelon Galactica. Um, and also the pianist uh, Vicky Ray, who's with the California Ear Unit. I found that those two were, were, were really, really great. Um, so if you've not listened to the show and you want a place to start, I would, I would start with those two. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah. yeah.
And, and I'm sorry, actually, did I miss what your question was? Oh, no. I no, that's it. <laughs> 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 well, I, I can figure out how to listen to podcasts quickly. Nate's, Nate's more technical <laughs> concern was how he could get through them all quickly. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this information seems... Yeah. Well, on the on the iPhones and iPods, there's a 2X uh, button okay. on the near someplace on the on the play button. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I'll, I'll find that button. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Problem yeah, solved. Sorry, one more one more thing. Just because okay. I somebody I don't remember which of the hosts on the show is the person that um, is gets so annoyed with all the New York centric stuff. Who's that? <laughs> that's that's Mercedes. That's this guy. Yeah. I, don't, I don't get that annoyed. No, no. I, just, I always if, want to point it out. If there's yeah, anybody yeah, no, who gets annoyed with anything, it's usually Sam. I think. I, I just wanted to say that I actually grew up on the West Coast, and I'm, I'm really sympathetic, and I, I feel lucky to be to be here right now and spend some time living in New York. But cool. it drives me crazy when everybody feels like. It's literally the center of the universe, mm-hmm. and so and so. Actually, I, I took this to heart when I was doing the podcast. Um, if you if you look through, I made a real effort to not make it <clears throat> totally New York centric. There are musicians from ensembles all over the country. Um, there's many international uh, musicians and ensembles. Um, I, I just it was really important to me to, to make an effort for it to be um, a national international thing because there's so many great players and so many great ensembles all across the country and, the, and there's a lot here in new york too but um there's a lot of really great things happening in a lot of other places right, right. absolutely yeah well thanks well, for being well, part well, of sam the good appreciates cause, yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> right uh, sam oh yes yeah after last week though i'm expecting that we're gonna be big in the uk <laughs> <laughs> actually carrie was a guest on the show you can listen to uh I have an episode with the Juice Vocal Ensemble, and Carrie was part of that. That's Great. awesome. Oh. Last year. So if you look for the Juice Juice Ensemble episode, you can listen to <laughs> Carrie and her uh, two other partners in the group. Yeah, excellent. I listen to some of their music, and I I really enjoy. It's very it. cool. Very cool yep. stuff. Well, should we uh, dig into our stories? Yeah. So you mentioned composers are jerks sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of people who are jerks. Some um, to nearly all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Rush Limbaugh, uh, if you're not aware, called a very nice young woman a prostitute a few weeks ago on his show, um, among other things. And uh, <laughs> and good people everywhere are responding poorly to his comments. <laughs> <laughs> Or yeah, at least they, negatively. I think they're responding very well, but they're having a negative <laughs> reaction. <laughs> it's worth pointing out, I do not want to belabor this point too long. Yeah. But it's worth pointing out that this was not just something he said. This was a multi-day campaign of right. badgering over the topic. Right. Yeah. The point is, Rush Limbaugh is a terrible, terrible human being. Yeah. And some of his advertisers finally figured this out and decided <laughs> that they didn't want their brand to be associated with... Uh, terrible terrible human beings and they pulled their sponsorship from his shows a lot of national advertisers he's syndicated on a lot of radio shows all over the country probably all over the world Mm -hmm. uh and uh they pulled their advertising there but a lot of local advertisers as well notably the philadelphia orchestra um and i gotta say the most surprising thing about this is that the philadelphia orchestra had enough money left to have uh radio ads after all they've been through in the last year um but they have congratulations philadelphia orchestra pulled their sponsorship uh from rush limbaugh on the local cbs radio affiliate and dave on a related story for years rush limbaugh has been using uh spirit of the radio by uh super awesome canadian prog rock band rush they had uh and I don't think Rush even realized that this was the case, but a few days ago they had their lawyer send Rush a cease and desist um, order so he is no longer going to be using that song in his <laughs> opening credits. So wait, Rush the band sent Rush Limbaugh a right. cease and desist order. Okay, good. You see the connection. <laughs> They're called Rush. I'm called Rush. And they have a song called Spirit of Radio. I yeah, mean, right. What so, could I mean, possibly go wrong? Right. <laughs> so anyway. So yeah, and, he's he's a jerk. Let's move on. <laughs> I'm a big Rush fan from way back, so yeah. I had to throw that in. Yeah. Also, in a completely unrelated story, Joshua but it's Bell. Equally like, Whoa. what? <laughs> but it equally dumbfounding in its uh, <laughs> in what it actually is. 
Joshua Bell's hotel was burglarized in Spain last week. Uh, he was performing at the time, so don't worry, his violin is still fine. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that, but witnesses say that Joshua Bell robbed his own apartment, kind of, <laughs> or his own hotel room. So this guy, who apparently must look strikingly like Joshua Bell, went up to the the hotel concierge and convinced them that he had forgotten his key and they gave him a new key. And then he used that key to get into Joshua Bell's hotel room. And, and then, then, after, after getting, getting a little <laughs> feedback, feedback from Sam... From Sam. Uh, uh, sorry. Then he got in a like a towel as though he had just gotten out of the bathtub or whatever. Genius move. A, a brilliant move. <laughs> genius stroke. And calls the uh, front desk to say he needs help getting into the safe. <laughs> and they they send somebody up there. <laughs> Thanks for that sound bite. That's why you were getting feedback. I was preparing. <laughs> And then they they sent somebody up there to help the thief get into Joshua Bell's safe. So they just stole some of his valuables. Uh, a a thirty eight thousand dollar watch, his laptop, like, a bunch of his other stuff. A it's violinist a, it's, has a thirty eight thousand dollar watch. It's not just a uh, let's be. It's not I, a violinist. I, I, it's Joshua Bell, right? But I nobody understand. needs a thirty eight thousand dollar watch. And I think that's. I. Th it seems like that's kind of what happened he's so famous that somebody like they don't ask for his id for these things because he's joshua bell and so somebody who looks like enough like him they just kind of let that go i don't know which is uh, i wonder if the dude can play violin that sounds like it sounds like a movie just waiting to happen right, right. this like, is sort of this is somewhat off topic but it's related in one way and you guys should check it out npr had a story about a guy that looks just like barack obama yeah. But he doesn't sound anything like Barack Obama. So all he's going to do is put on a suit and, and people start like either going, hey, look, Mr. President, or start screaming obscenities at him, depending on <laughs> whether he's in a red state or a blue state. Yeah, it's an interesting story. You can yeah. Check. yeah. So so sometimes we we like to do like outside news that's not. <laughs> and and well, these, these are both linked to at least a little bit. Well, the thing about it is, is that you – for that plan to have worked, that person had to have known, obviously, that they look a lot like Joshua Bell. Right. So they're in some way connected to the new or to the violin world or something. You know, they didn't just uh, they didn't just decide to do this when they saw Joshua Bell getting off the plane in England or whatever. You know, this this had took some planning. Yeah, that would be a really interesting thing. Like, I wonder if this Joshua Bell doppelganger can play violin, but poorly or something. Well, if There's he's a Spanish <laughs> guy, does he have a does did did he like have a Spanish accent when he was asking when he was pretending to be Joshua Bell? So this we're seems, all the hotel This seems going, really improbable to me. I I it's, I don't know. It seems like a lot. Not only would this have guy, this guy would either have to be really, really good, or the hotel t staff would have to be really, really dumb. Oh. In any case, we're very sorry, Joshua <laughs> Bell, that you lost your stuff, and this we is a very that, bizarre cir circumstance. Yeah. We assume, as always, that Joshua Bell watches the show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you want to come on and talk about it, we'll, 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 we'll welcome you with open arms. <laughs> We'll offer you grief counseling yeah. for your for your thirty eight thousand dollar watch. Yeah. So Sam wanted to mention this particular story. Sam, I'll let you talk about this. Uh, I, I guess we I, I've been describing it as a poem. Yes. Well, some of you may know, and and I can't imagine. I have to think that this is a tip of the hat to uh, <laughs> Dr. Seuss. March second was Dr. Seuss Seuss's birthday. And uh, let me just read the opening uh, paragraph here. This is a piece by Rob Deemer on newmusicbox.org, and I thought it was just brilliant, and I really enjoyed it. First paragraph. We hear things. We hear Skip things no one else can hear, and sometimes we're not sure whether or not we can hear them either. But we think that we can hear them so intensely that we end up hearing something, and that will do. As long as there's something to hear, everybody's happy. Um, and it continues in this way uh, and sounds gets more Dr. Susie in its, in its presentation as it goes along, where it circles back on itself, repeating the things that it's that it's already said. 
And uh, it's basically about the uh, the relationship between composers and listeners and what we bring to the experience and what they bring to the experience and sort of the dynamic or the transformation that happens when you've imagined this thing and gone through all the steps to get it played and then it happens and it transfers over to the listeners and becomes something else that is very similar to what you meant, but not exactly the same. Um, and, you know, I can go on describing what it's getting at, but the best way uh, is to read it. And I think I, I agree with Dave. It is a poem. And, uh, and, and this is something that I think we need more of this kind of thing, a thoughtful, artistic, you know, presentation of a simple compositional idea that we've talked about on the show a lot. But I think it kind of gives some perspective um, seeing it presented in this way. Well, but yeah, anyway. and it's nice to, to see, uh, you know, composers making really nice things out of words. Yeah. Right. Right. It's a really, really cool thing. And, and it's something that uh, there's kind of a long history of, of composers and performers writing. Uh, and, and not everybody is good enough to do it, but clearly, clearly Rob is. Yeah. Um, and Anne Majette had a great article in the Washington Post this last week about... Um, musicians doing the same thing and musicians kind of as their own critics and how sometimes critics kind of stink at writing about music um and musicians sometimes are, are better at it now i i would say that that's probably not always the case right. there are plenty of musicians who stink at writing about music too and often music or critics are pretty good writers right in general <laughs> <laughs> uh but she's kind of taking a lot of critics to task for kind of the the laundry list type reviews like they played this and they played this and they played this and I, that's like reading baseball scores basically mm -hmm. um and she particularly mentions jeremy dank in this this article um and if you don't read jeremy dank's blog think dank uh you absolutely should it's 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 quite amusing and it's very well written he had a great piece about the the process of recording uh, Charles Ives in the New Yorker a few weeks ago. It was fantastic writing, and it was a really interesting article. So uh, you should check out both Anne Majette and uh, Jeremy Dank. Do you guys have any thoughts on this this Anne Majette piece? Well, it's another reason to love Anne Majette for one thing. Right. <laughs> um, I I think that the and she kind of suggests at this a little bit in the article, but the thing to think to that I take away one of the big things is that the the role and purpose of a critic, like the newspaper critic, the person whose job it is to get paid to do that kind of thing, is can't possibly be the same as it would have been throughout history as it is now because I mean we harp on this constantly, but anybody can write a review and some people might do a much better job. So I think if you're going to be a good critic, you you better be leaning towards trying to start a conversation mm -hmm. and gain some insight rather than just going down a laundry list. Right. There hasn't been a comment section in in a lot of publications in the 1500s and everything, I'm sure. So. <laughs> right. I think, right. I think one of the things that's that's so... Um, I mean, I, I didn't... I kind of went over this this uh, Amajet thing really, really quickly. But um, it just in general, it drives me crazy that the lack of opinion that you see in these reviews. I totally you know? agree. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, it, it was something that didn't really sink in until I moved to the city and was actually going to some of these concerts that would get New York Times reviews the next day. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they actually say nothing. Yeah. Right. You know, it's just like, this is a blow by blow of what happened. And you just, I just, it's the few times where you actually read a review where you feel like the person has an opinion is so refreshing. And it, but yes. it's just so, it's so rare. Well, that's her point, is that you're, you're going to get opinions if you have composers or performers writing the, the, right. the reviews. Um, mm -hmm. And she points out that it seems like critics are afraid to say anything negative. And <laughs> I can tell you, composers are not afraid to say anything negative. So, Do you know any people like that, Sam? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> but it, it begs the question, like, uh, in the rest of the newspaper, I, from what I understand... Uh, writers might get criticized for expressing opinions so so explicitly like of i mean relating the news of of what happened that seems like part of the role of the newspaper as well 
Yeah, but you can't relate the news of a musical event really with text in, in any kind of way that means anything if all you're going to do is say this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. So you're going to have to use an opinion. The other thing, this is going with what, along with what Jim said, you said this laundry list doesn't mean anything. If they get away from the laundry list, they use some idiotic metaphor trying to describe the way the music sounded or whatever that is equally meaningless. Like, well, it just seems like it was, there's a difference. It was like between... traveling down the lagoon in a in a boat with the moon and like. Ah, ah. <laughs> just, I'm sorry, Jim, big, go ahead. There, well, there's just a big difference between the idea of somebody being a reporter and somebody being a critic. Yeah. Right. I mean, if if their role is really just to be a reporter, then you want to stick to the facts and you want to try and convey those as cleanly and unbiased as possible. But if you're a critic, then kind of the reason we want to read you is because you have an opinion. And it's just so yeah. rare that they do, uh, okay. right? Yeah. And it's it's kind of it's it's tricky because they do also serve the role of the reporter. Like they're kind of two parts that I think a good review has. First, it does just tell you what happened because I think the assumption is that most people reading the review weren't there. Yeah. Um, and then the other part is to, to help shape a discussion around the the value of what happened, um, and that. I think is the thing that, and that does seem like the optimal most of the time. The optimal uh, piece review, where you get to you get to read the news and then also get something of like uh, expert feedback and and qu really quality like, evaluation of the piece or whatever. Right, yeah. and we should say that Anne Majette does this very well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, anyway, uh, at the end of the piece, she even accepts that that to get good writing about music. It might mean more musicians and fewer critics. So she's even accepted the fact that it might mean fewer critics proper, um, but that's a worthwhile trade-off if we start getting better writing about music. Or maybe these papers should start en enlisting their uh, critics in piano lessons and things like that. <laughs> yeah. That might be interesting. Right. So last week we had Carrie Andrew on the show, uh, and if you missed it, you should check it out because she was great. Um, but we talked to her about um the the dearth of of women composers on concert programs and she had just written a piece uh it, back in february for the guardian about this issue and it's an issue that has come up a lot this past week because uh international women's day was this last week and uh david smook wrote a great article in friend of the show friend of the david. show david smook wrote <laughs> wrote a piece uh with with some numbers and some, and some pies and you can't convince anybody about anything with without numbers and in particular i i think it's good when those numbers are in the form of pie um <laughs> tasty helps 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 the medicine go down that's right um so he has put together a number of pie charts demonstrating uh how few women composers or how, how little women composers are represented on the programs of major new music ensembles in the united states mm -hmm. it's kind of surprising um to me how 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 few there are um he starts with uh lotus um and they do pretty well at 28 percent women which is kind of shocking to call that doing well yeah um but some of the other like big deal ensembles uh are are not doing so hot bang on a can 22 jack 12 eighth blackbird at 18 ensembles on the end table but the nine. biggest chauvinist pig dogs are i'm <laughs> you're gonna finish that <laughs> thing <laughs> That's right. Sam Mercier. sound or a bunch of chauvinist pig dogs. That was Sam Mercier, everybody. That was Sam. That was this guy. I joke, of course. I joke. <laughs> so um, and I think what was great about Carrie's article was that she's, I mean, certainly we could stand for, as they say in the UK, some positive prejudice to uh, help ameliorate the, the imbalance, but she wasn't. She was had a very practical point of view about it. This is not like we're not trying to prove that Alarm Will Sound or anyone else is being unfair. I mean, certainly they could do more, but the problem is is access to female composers who are writing music, and there's just not as many. Um, and the way to solve that is education and starting earlier. So, 
but this is just a very drastic uh, explanation of, of how, how out of balance it is. I, th I think it's worth noting on this that, uh, um, I mean, David, David comments on this in his post, if I remember right, that he, he tries to acknowledge that his methods were very unscientific. Yeah, sure. Um, right. and, I, and I think it's worth reemphasizing that. I mean, I, I don't want to come out and defend all these ensembles necessarily, but I, I just want to emphasize that, uh, you know, it, it's hard to use a, a consistent tracking, you know, right. uh, Sure. Uh, metrics between all this stuff. I, I'm sure that in general that, that he's probably right, but I, I just want to just want to point that out. I mean, my, my experience with this um, from from people I've talked to and, and know who have ensembles, and, I, and I'm friends with people in many of these groups they they mentioned here. Mm -hmm. It's it's so rare that I hear anybody talking about anything other than picking music that they feel strongly about. Yeah. Um, it's. I mean, it, I, I don't think any of these these groups um, are, are trying to, you know, go either way on the on the gender issue. I mean, they 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 get submissions from people, or they find people that they really believe in, and those are the people that they want to commission, and those are the people they want to perform. I, I, I'm totally with you guys and with Carrie on the idea that the problem is is less with these new music ensembles and their artistic decisions, and really on the uh, colleges, universities, the high schools, the junior highs, and just not having enough female role models in um, uh, as kids are growing up and learning music, you know? Yes. The more, the more women we can have in university positions te teaching composition, and the more, uh, just all these things, it takes so long for it to happen, but then um, I, I think that's, that's the root of the problem, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, having a having a we talked about last week. No one on the show has even had the opportunity to study with a female composer throughout their very long and expensive educations. Yeah, my um, and so having a, a female faculty member in the composition area is going to have way more impact than you know if Alarm Will Sound starts having two extra commissions a year specific, exclusively for female composers. Mm -hmm. Which would be helpful, but not nearly as you know at the root of the problem as dealing with it in the education system. Yeah, and, and, I and I, right, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I just want to say I just want to throw in that uh, I feel a little bit like you guys did last week, where it's a little weird to have a bunch of dudes talking yeah. about this. But, <laughs> right. But but it's also just worth mentioning that um, yeah, you know I have I've I've gotten to know the International Contemporary Ensemble a little bit better over the last year, mm. and they have a really great program called Ice Lab which some people might know about. Yeah. Yeah. They basically they basically pick six composers each year and work with them for a whole year on a new new piece. Mm -hmm. And two last year two of the six composers were women. This year three of the six composers were were women and they haven't announced next year's yet, but I think that there's going to be at least one um but but like I said they haven't announced it yet. So um I I know that they're, you know, at least uh I, I don't know how much that plays into their decision process, but it's it's definitely part of uh, uh, the people they've chosen to work with for these these big projects. Yeah, yeah. and I I think humanity as a whole would probably appreciate it about the work coming first, and then having right. that, and then having these numbers even out as the yeah. culture changes. And, but the right. truth is, there's a lot of really talented women composers. Yeah, out there. yeah. There's just so many, and and. Um, and that's yeah, a point that Carrie Andrews was making too, that there yeah. are an incredible number of women making valuable work and And yeah, you know, yeah. one of one of the composers in residence at Chicago Symphony right now is a young um young woman named uh, Anna Klein. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, any any kind of socially embedded imbalance or prejudice like this is frustrating because the way to solve it, you can't pull a switch and fix it. Well, yeah. Some things you kind of can, but not really. But this kind of thing, you can't pull a switch and fix it. You have to decide, we're going to start talking about this and over time figure out how to fix it. And that's yeah. the only way it's going to get fixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but I show my students in my music appreciation class occasionally clips from uh, the videos of Leonard Bernstein's Young, per young People's Concerts. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh there are no women in the orchestra in in these old black and white mm. videos of of the New York Philharmonic. There there simply are none at all. Yeah. Um, and certainly today, that's you know not even close to the case. Right. So it it takes a long time, and and it happens by just you know over over time, you know making more women composers and making more uh, women classical musicians at 
when they're kids, you know. <laughs> you know. So we as a culture just need to pr- produce more female composers. The way you phrase that it sounds like there's like there's a factory, a, a paste or something <laughs> that you put on kids. Like you're gonna right. be a composer. <laughs> That's how it works, right? <laughs> That's it. They're gonna women are gonna save classical music, Dave. Now is that it? That's no. That's what. I think that's, that's quite true. a leap. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trying because that's been the theme lately. It was Asians, and then it was Dudamel, and I figured we would. Uh, it's pretty re- much just the, Dudamel. <laughs> lay, the responsibility, lay the responsibility on women for saving uh, classical music now. Well, I and, think... an, an, an army of Asian women led by Dudamel. <laughs> Can we just reemphasize who's making these statements? <laughs> but it's, it's, Sam it's all Sam Rasiers. Yeah. Send your mail to Sam. Yeah. <laughs> at, at House Goy on Twitter, you can you can spam his his Twitter account. <laughs> um, so speaking of controversial uh, topics, yes, yeah, speaking um, of controversial topics, indeed. Yeah, give us the last word. Dave. So hopefully, this, this finally, is not be the hopefully, last finally, word. we can put this stupid thing to bed. It uh, won't be. Oswaldo Galerhoff has finally uh, made public statements about his um, issue around Sidarius. If you've not been following this or listening to the show, uh, he was first accused of plagiarizing a piece by uh, Michael Ward Bergman called Barbic and orchestrating it uh, in, in fulfillment of a consortium commission from the League, based on a League of American Orchestras outgoing president. Uh, and uh, there were, I think, 35 orchestras that all bought into this. And in a premiere, at, or not a premiere, a performance with the Eugene Symphony in Oregon, a couple of people spotted this similarity. And uh, a lot of people wrote about it, and a lot of people called him some nasty things. And there were a surprisingly large number of people, I thought, defending him. Uh, and we're not going to... Uh, discuss this again you can go back a couple of weeks to to find our discussion with that uh but finally galhov has has spoken for himself he's got a piece uh, in the new york times with a big interview uh with him uh it's kind of uh i don't think it helps his case a whole lot but um whatever he says that he created this material for uh, for this piece in collaboration with Michael Ward Bergman on, while they were working on a film score a few years ago. Uh, it didn't make it into the film, mm-hmm. but they had both created it together, and they both kind of agreed, well, this is good material, and we should uh, you know, hang on to it, and we can each do whatever we want with it. And so it just so happens, I suppose, that Ward Bergman used it first, and then uh, a couple of years later... Uh, Golenhoff used it for for this piece. Um, I still contend that, e- regardless of of whether or not it was created collaboratively or created by one person and then used by the other person, uh, Golenhoff still didn't credit Michael Ward Bergman in in the score for this other piece. And it doesn't matter whether you have permission to use somebody else's material if you put your name on it then and, and not theirs then i think that's plagiarism all the same do, and, you, do you know if michael w- ward bergman credited golhov in his piece i don't think so mm. <laughs> <laughs> so you know i mean they worked on it together and it seems like the information is pretty clear and out there and if to me, i'm not had, bothered by the yeah. plagiarism plagiarism angle i'm, I'm not uh, by, yeah it's the fact that he's supposed to be writing a new piece in it's funny, I was just sitting here thinking, it's like, well, both of these guys are just, like, admitting that they're operating as a professional composer in a world where limited distribution and a, a limited number of people actually hearing the music can be counted on in a way that would preclude people even knowing that this was going on. And only because, you know, Goliath got caught, if you want to put it that way, because he only had the piece by, played by, what, 34 orchestras or whatever, you know? <laughs> And he made it as far as he did without anybody saying anything. So, so. I, I feel like the the conflict here is people feeling like the orchestra didn't get their money's worth. Correct. And, I mean, they, I don't think that... It seems like that's not how they feel. <coughs> I don't know. I don't know if, if I've, I've read anything from any of the orchestras involved in this yeah. project. Um, so, we'll, we'll see. But it's... 
I don't know. Like I said, I'm 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 not I'm not interested in discussing this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spent, somebody's the internet has as a whole has spent way too much time on this issue. Yeah. It, it better like, you know, a Maltese Falcon is gonna have to show up on somebody's desk or something for me to want to pay attention to this anymore. That was a that was an old film reference for those of you playing the, the home plot, game. The plot is gonna have to get a lot more intriguing for me to want to pay attention to that. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. So, on to something completely different. We have not had any good segues today. I apologize. I want to point out that last week when I was doing segues, everything went awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you you figure this one out. Golihoff to the Las Vegas Performing Arts Center. Well, uh, Golihoff made a big mistake. You know where else they like to do it big? Las Vegas. <laughs> and where people make big mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. And they do their arts big. Yeah. So the Smith Center opens in Las Vegas this week. Uh or was it just just this week that it opened? Yeah. March second. Yeah. So it was just this just this last week. Um a uh, a new performing arts center for classical music in Las Vegas, which as we all know is a mecca of classical music. Um and when I say classical I mean Elvis. <laughs> uh, it, it's a beautiful building there's photos here uh, from Las Vegas Weekly um, I don't know what to say about this it seems like an, not a, a kind of a surprising place for a new performing arts center don't you think? well it depends on what they really use it for um, I mean if all they do is have big, huge concerts in there, but it says it's supposed to be dedicated to education too. And Broadway. Um, and you know, it, it, Las Vegas isn't just a people where go, place where people go to give them money um, for free. People actually live there. Right. So who can say? I mean, it's kind of weird. I think it's a, I think it's cool, and I hope that it turns out great. But it's weird in a time when we're it seems like we're always talking about small venues and more community oriented this, that, and the other. For someone to spend 10 years building, you know, a giant cathedral of the arts the way has been the way for a long time, you know, and, and I begrudge them not. I hope it works out. Um, but, you know, they're going to have to figure it's not like you can just build it and they will come anymore. <laughs> they're going to figure out how to use that space wisely. Yeah. If, if they can use it as a as, as cultural center, not just for Las Vegas, but to have festivals and things there that will bring in people from sure, outside. Yeah. Yeah. They, they should have a like do a, some kind of a residency orchestra during the summer and have a you know as people still write for orchestras and you know it'd be cool to yeah have i mean maybe it'll bring some tourists into las vegas <laughs> yeah. right because i right. know they don't have a lot of that right now yeah i mean and the article that we read from las vegas weekly dot com they they do say that a lot of the vocals are or the the locals are trying trying to make it as much of a a local kind of cultural hub as well for expression of like so there are people who do this kind of stuff there and this could be an incredible space for worldwide and uh acts from everywhere but also to be that that local spot as well hopefully right. yeah well they spent it was 10 years in development and it is beautiful it's a it is sort very of beautiful you should definitely check out this link and and see some of the pictures i've shown a few of them but there are a lot more, and it's, it's 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 like sort of retro Art Deco looking, and they they say that that's kind of what they were going for. Excellent. Well, yeah. then I would say they succeeded. It yeah. looks pretty retro Art Deco to me. So I think it's time for the pick of the week. Woo. The pick of the week. <laughs> All right, our pick of the week. Is... <laughs> you gotta stop doing that. Sam. <laughs> Don't stop. <laughs> Our pick of the week this week is by our, our guest composer, uh, Jim Holt. Uh, is a piece for Squonk, which is a bass clarinet duo, which is a really interesting uh, medium. Do you want to tell us uh, a little bit about this piece? Is it an interesting title? Uh, sure. It reminds so, me of productivity books. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> um, so, I mean, first of all, if, if anybody out there doesn't know the, the amazing... Um, awesomeness of two bass clarinets. Um, they should meet uh, Squonk in some way. Um, this is a bass clarinet duo based in San Francisco, and they basically 
play music written for them. So uh, they're amazing, <clears throat> really amazing musicians. So uh, I wrote this piece for them a couple of years ago, um, and they released it on their second album, which came out, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago. But um, yeah, I, there's a there's a one sentence version of the program note, which I which I like, and actually I think this sums it all up perfectly. So the name of the piece is Action Items. And those of you who work in an office um, probably are very familiar, <laughs> with as I am, items. as I am with uh, words like action items. Um, so, so the one the one sentence version of the program note is reclaiming lame corporate buzzwords through squonkification. Um, nice. So, I, I, mean, I mean, basically, I was just working on this piece and I was trying to make it something exciting for them. Um, I was sitting in a meeting and somebody would not stop making reference to their action items, and I was like, actually, that's. That's what the name of this. That's what the name of this piece should be. That's uh, that's it. I found it. I'm I'm not familiar with that term, an action item, and, and that's it. <laughs> that's probably I, a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I love it because I am a fan of short program. Yep. Action items that's... are things in your email inbox that you can act on right away. Oh, now you've ruined them. Now you've ruined them. <laughs> so Jim, I knew about this duo because my wife is a doctor of clarinet performance and. Anytime you go to the some of the base some of the clarinet clinics and you see these guys and it's you know I can go to that room and see the Brahms E flat sonata and go to this room and see the Brahms you know trio or look what's going on over there so after a festival everybody's always talking about these guys and it's oh, just a rock and live performance when they do stuff oh did you like. you saw them at a festival I I didn't but my wife did oh, yeah. and I've seen there's plenty of YouTube fodder for these guys as well <clears throat> and. Uh, I was talking earlier before we started uh, recording that from a professional point of view, and I don't mean as a composer, these guys are playing on some finely adjusted bass clarinets, let me tell you. <laughs> because the key noise is very minimal, which is, is hard to get on a bass clarinet. These guys are amazing. Do we want to listen to a little bit yeah, of this? Here we go. Yes. Sure. Listen sure. to a little bit of, of, of action items by our guests. Play the, play the beginning Holmes. and then skip to like five minutes in. That's my favorite part. Yeah, it gets all wound up as you go along. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Good. jump ahead a little bit. Make a little another little jump for a lack of time. So those are some excerpts from yep. uh, our, our our guest composer. Jim Holt, this piece, Action Items, performed by Squonk, bass clarinet duo. Very, very cool stuff. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, sure. Thanks, guys. Uh, I really like it. It's such a, amazingly aggressive. In, in an orchestral context, you'd never think of the bass clarinet as this ballsy <clears throat> instrument, but it definitely uh, very edgy in, in a really cool way. Well, so I also really wanted to try and sound like there were more than just two of them there. I don't know yeah. how much that yeah. comes across. but It you know. does, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, it, to me, the amazing thing about a bass clarinet, especially today, because just like every other instrument in the orchestral literature, the expectations of players who call themselves players and have degrees is much higher than it would have been in the past. 
So with good current, you know, contemporary players, you can treat a bass clarinet as far as the kind of control a clarinet, like a B-flat clarinet, if you know how to write that, you can pretty much ask a bass clarinet to do anything that you ask a B-flat clarinet to do, almost. And if you cross the line, they'll tell you. But <laughs> well, this is actually one of those great situations where I actually knew these guys pretty well um, right. before I wrote the piece. Mm -hmm. And back um, when I was in college, clarinet and bass clarinet were the instrument I played the most. So oh, okay. I, I was able to, uh, I mean, I, I don't think I could probably pull off playing this piece myself, especially <laughs> now. But, um, but there are definitely some things in there that were like, you know, things that make playing the bass clarinet awesome. Yeah. 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 Like that, the, the second part we cut to, all those sort of niente attacks and how fast they can jump register while doing that kind of thing, that's a clarinet thing. Yeah. And and I didn't know that you were a clarinetist. I, too, am a clarinetist in recovery. Way out of practice. <laughs> I actually kind of miss it, but... Um, yeah, I, well, I, performing is something to miss. That guy right there. Oh, there that is. looks like a bass clarinet, clarinet case. Yeah. yeah. Nice. If you need it overhauled... Serious. <laughs> RidianWins.com. Yeah. yeah, ship it over to Michigan. It's way if, overdue. Way if overdue. it's got any kind of joint or tenon problem, we specialize in doing that. Yeah, it has it has some problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's not surprising that you play clarinet because that sounded very you know, it was very clarinetty in a in a in a good way. I just love the bass clarinet. Such a great instrument. Yes. Uh, I'm I'm kinda curious. Whenever whenever I have the opportunity to write for a a, a really badass performer or badass group of performers it's really tempting to like just throw everything at them yeah and i was wondering how you um, do you have this is this just me or is this a, a universal thing and, and if so did you how did you deal with that um <clears throat> no i i definitely have that problem i mean whenever i'm starting a new piece one of the first things i do is just think of those instruments and what are the really cool things that only those instruments can do Right. Or what are the things that sound really cool on those instruments? And then it's just this kind of sometimes painful task of trying to narrow that that list down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's but that's definitely what happened in this piece. I mean, there's really only um, I think two ideas that happen, and they kind of get you know varied a little bit as you go along. But there's really just two ideas, and those are just you know two of the things that I thought would sound really great on bass clarinets. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you again so much for for sharing that with us. Sure. Uh, it was great. Thank and thank you again for for being on the show. It's been been great talking to you. It's been. I'm so glad you guys had me on. I'm I'm so happy. Very, have, and I lo and I love what you guys are doing. Well, thanks. Thanks. Do you have any and, any last minute things you want to plug? Um, I plugged Switchboard, which is April first. I already plugged Hotel Elephant, which is this coming Thursday. If you're in New York, cool. Plug your blog um, again or your podcast again. Yeah. So the the podcast, um, there may not be new episodes for a little while, but you can find all of them on iTunes or at myearsareopen.net. Great. Um, we'll have links on yeah. the show page. Yeah. It's great. We'll, we'll have links to all those things. Uh, and uh, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Sound Notion. To read more about any of the stories that we talked about or for links to any of Jim's stuff or, or even the pick of the week, go to our website, soundnotion.tv slash SN, uh, and you can also leave us a note there if you have any comments on any of the stories that we've talked about. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. We're at Sound Notion on Twitter. This show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store as are uh, Jim's episodes of My Ears Are Open, and you can subscribe there for free and catch them all, uh, just like Pokemon. <laughs> Be sure to subscribe there so that you can do just that. Yeah. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo, who is not with us this week and might not also not be here next week, but we'll have him back soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week.